Hello and welcome to our Early Start Research Seminar, working with government organisations, departments and local health districts. I'm Lisa Kirvin, I'm the Director of Research here at Early Start, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging that wherever we are in Australia, we're meeting on Aboriginal country. Today, I'm here at Early Start at UIW on Dharawal country, and this country stretches from southern Sydney in our north to Nowra in our south. We have our beautiful escarpment in the west and the ocean in the east. I recognise the connection to the land and waters and thank Aboriginal people for protecting this coastline and ecosystems. Here at UIW, we're physically based at the base of Mount Kira, an area that has always been a great place of knowledge and learning. And with that, I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal people. The purpose of this Early Start Research series is to focus on research conversations specifically for early childhood researchers and to recognise and celebrate the expertise that we have within our Early Start networks. Many have participated in our previous seminars live and through our YouTube channel and we thank you and we, we encourage you to continue to make that connection with us. For our conversation today, we have an amazing panel together and I truly couldn't do their introductions justice, so I'm going to pass to each of them to introduce themselves and we'll start with you, Catherine. Thank you. Uh, my name is Catherine Van Wiedenberg. I am the manager of the Health Promotion Service for Illawarra Shoalhaven Local Health District. I've been in that role for one year and continuing. However, prior to that, I spent 23 years working for a community-based health promotion organisation called Healthy Cities Illawarra, and then I joined the district as a health promotion officer, connecting with communities around improving their health and wellbeing, and I was in that role for seven years prior to stepping into the manager's role. So I'm really looking forward to this discussion today, so thank you for inviting me. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Catherine. My name's Scott Snyder. I work with the University of Wollongong in a role which is our industry and community partnerships coordinator. Been in the role about two years. My primary focus is helping with identification of tenders, tender projects, specifically with a local, state, federal government, but also support a lot of the academics with their stakeholder engagement activities from stakeholder mapping through to engagement strategies. Uh, before I joined at UOW, I uh, spent the best part of a decade working in uh, corporate sales, business development and stakeholder engagement with a significant focus uh, around health and the not-for-profit space. Thanks, Scott and Catherine. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Kylie Lipscomb. I'm from the School of Education. Um, I'm the Academic Program Director of Educational Leadership. I've been at UOW now for 12 years, which I can't believe, um, actually, um, working both in the initial teacher education and postgraduate space. Prior to that, uh, I worked in schools, um, predominantly in Victoria, as a school teacher, um, middle leader and school leader, um, and system leader, actually, for about 13 years. I've you know, had the joy of working in lots of partnership work, both within the community and in school systems, and I hope to be able to share some of that experience with you today. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks so much. What an amazing panel. And just uh, as a bit of an introduction to this panel, this topic came from our collaborations and, and consultations with early start researchers that just said, we really want to know how to work, work best with partners. What is it that we need to know? What is it that we need to do? And so um, we put together a bit of a dream team in the panel. Catherine, you've had such great experiences being the partner, as the partner there. Kylie, you have an impressive record in terms of leading tenders. And Scott, the support that you offer to our researchers in terms of the application process and, and the relationship ongoing is, is quite phenomenal. I wonder if each of you might be able to share with us an example of a project that has worked well. Let's start with the best case scenarios. Catherine, do you want to start us off? Yeah, sure, sure. I have an example that is very specific to Early Start, and that is we are a partner on the Prevention Research Support Program um, that's affectionately known by us as the PRSP. Um, the grant was has been led by um, Senior Professor Tony Oakley 
from early start um, and that partnership program is now in its sixth year. Initially, the first round of funding that was secured by Tony was for a four-year period. And since then, there's been, he's had success securing a second round of funding, which has given us an additional two years so far. Just to sort of help you understand what some of the objective, key objectives of the partnership program actually are. The first is to generate high quality research evidence that's relevant to New South Wales health prevention priorities and which can inform the implementation of prevention policies, programs and services in New South Wales. So I think, you know, that objective in itself really states that the partnership wants to deliver something which is really relevant and usable and transferable to not just New South Wales Health, but other government bodies and services where the information is relevant. And the second objective is to support the translation of research evidence into prevention policies, programs and services across New South Wales. I mean, and that is that is the absolute um, objective. That's the reason why we're there. There's no point in doing the research without being able to translate it. And I think that circles back to what we will be discussing more today, which is, you know, being very clear on what is it that we want to achieve and why. The third objective of the partnership is to build the prevention research capability of New South Wales health staff and their systems to create, understand and use knowledge and evidence in their work. And that has been an incredibly valuable uh, part for our organisation. We do have support to do research within our organisation, but everybody is busy doing their, delivering their core business. In health, the job is enormous and often research slips right off the page. We don't have the funding, we don't have the time, we don't. So to be able to partner with a university like Wollongong that has all that expertise wrapped up has just been incredibly valuable to us. When it comes to why that's worked so well, I just think it's been a perfect fit for both our organisations. We've been able to, my service, the Health Promotion Service, has been able to employ a part-time research coordinator. She not only supports our staff to generate better quality research, Many of that, those staff have never been involved in research before. So this has been such a wonderful support and capacity building opportunity for our staff. And that flows on into the work that they do with other parts of ISLED, with other services, and them learning how to identify partners for health-related programs that we can work with other uh, parts of our organisation on. The initial and the second funding applications were written together. So our contribution was engaged right from the get-go. And it allowed us to also be part of the looking back on what were the successes of the first stage to, to be able to bring those across. And it, it, it isn't just, oh, great, UIW can do that bit. It's very important for our organisation to be part of the hard work and to keep that ownership and and I guess get a voice to say maybe what we'd like to add in and, and enhance for the second round. So the partnership in the first four years was between UIW, Illawarra Shoalhaven Local Health District, Southwestern Sydney Local Health District, and the Centre for Population Health in the Ministry. But now in the second round of funding, we've been able to expand that partnership to include quite a few new local health districts and that's help extend the reach of the PRSP right across the state into other places. I think it's been great to keep the program on the agenda of the ministry as well. They're aware of what's happening. They're not necessarily involved, you know, to the degree that we all are, but it's definitely they're aware, they're supportive, and they can see now that it has grown. I think you know, what's been a success is the initial two-way connection between us and UOW through our staff who knew of early start and which was sort of, I guess, less formal. That initial connection has led to an opportunity coming along, working together to secure that through 
an amazing grant application, and it's continued to support collaboration, not only between Illawarra Shoalhaven Local Health District and the uni, but all the other partners that are in the program now. So it's helped us to communicate better with the uni and stay in touch, and also encouraged us to look for other partnership opportunities and, and funding opportunities where they come up. So, yeah. Thanks so much, Catherine. What uh, what wonderful and rich examples um, you've been able to give us. And it's it's such a, such a privilege to hear around a partnership that's gone from four years and then moved into, into a second term and the partnerships have expanded there. I was really interested in your idea around um, the importance of translation of research, but, you know, research can slip off the page in industry. Kylie, I wonder if you might pick up and think about your example from the, the researcher perspective. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, I'm involved in a few tenders at the moment, but the one I, I wanted to share with you is, is quite a recent tender called the Middle Leadership Development Program. And that is in partnership with the New South Wales Department of Education, which is the second largest school system actually in the Southern Hemisphere but also a team of researchers from the University of Newcastle. So it's a, a three-way partnership, which is wonderful, but also adds some complexity as well. The aim of that particular program is really to build the capacity of middle leaders in New South Wales public schools. So middle leaders typically uh, hold a position of a head of department um, in high school. So they might be leading the English um, curriculum or the maths curriculum or they are assistant principals in primary school where they lead a stage, you know, um, different year levels within a stage and the teachers and students within that. There's actually 13,000 plus middle leaders in New South Wales um, public schools. So it's a, a very large and important group of formal leaders in our public schools. The program that we are part of is a first of its kind. So it was, the actual tender was an international tender that we pitched for a couple of years ago in 2020, I think we started the work. And the aim was to co-design with our partners, the program, and also co-implement the program. And we've been working on that now uh, for yeah, two, two, two and a half years. It's a four year contract with the possibility of a two year extension, which we're just about to sign over with. Overall, across those six years, we'll be working with about 3,000 middle leaders. So it's quite a substantial number of um, people that we're able to work with and learn from as well. I think probably one of the really important aspects, which I'll share a little bit more later on with you, is that that actual tender um, was founded on some commercial research that we did prior to the tender being released. So we were asked to do a commercial based research project to understand the needs of middle leaders in New South Wales public schools. So who they were to, in terms of the demographics, um, the professional learning and development needs that they feel that um, they require from the Department of Education, and also some of the roles and responsibilities that they are currently leading um, and finding challenging in their school. So it was an incredible opportunity as a researcher to be part of that study. It's the largest study into middle leadership in the world, actually. We had nearly 3,000 middle leaders um, participate. But then to be able to use that research as a foundation to then apply for the tender and, and be successful in that space as well. From a UOW perspective, not only is it wonderful to sort of combine the research with the teaching and learning arm of the work, but we've also been able to build in a credit articulation pathway. So the middle leaders that go through the program are able to go through a specific pathway where they receive credit into our Masters of Education, Educational Leadership degree. And after they complete their middle leadership development program, they can then come in and complete 50% um, of the master's degree and receive a, a, a um, qualification at the end. So, you know, it's a, it's a, incredible opportunity, I think, for all of us involved. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Kylie. The, the sheer magnitude of the work that you do and uh, Catherine, what you're doing, you know, health and education are such major players in, in, in society and particularly in our work in, in Early Start. Scott, I'm wondering how you're going to follow that with an example of, 
of a experience working in partnership. Thanks. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, look, hard to follow. Look, I think from my perspective, I spend a lot of my time supporting the application process. So working with you know, researchers, academics to, to get the best out of an application uh, process with a lot of these government departments. And I think I could probably draw upon an example earlier this year where I saw that it just all came together with that, with that partnership focus. I've supported a lot of tenders that weren't successful and, and a lot that were, but the key things that stuck out with me on the success of this is a multi-year, quite a large project was that the actual establishment of the partners early uh, was probably one of the key defining um, parameters around success. So this, in, this academic had strong relationships with the department dating back several years. They'd maintained significant contact um, over an extended period of time. They'd shared information. They'd shared background on what they did and a strong knowledge of the sector as well. But they also had a very strong core group of trusted partners. This was a really large project and they had strong relationships with other academics across other institutions. They had strong relationships and partnerships with uh, industry associations and relevant industry bodies that were involved as part of this application process. What One other thing that sticks out in my mind was they actually had a real good defined I guess, structure around what delivery looks like to them. So it was a real focus around, you know, what are the benefits and outcomes that they can deliver to the partner, what they can deliver to this, to the government department, and not so much a focus on, you know, what are we going to do? What I've seen a lot of is people will respond to these, these, these tender applications. I'll answer the questions on what we are going to do, but the focus needs to be about what are we, what's going to be done together, but what are the benefits and outcomes from a partnership perspective? It's very much that. It's working together. It's ensuring that everyone's on the same page. There's clear responsibility and accountabilities between the partners to ensure that you know, the outcomes are achieved as per defined or as per, as per agreed in the, in the partnership arrangement. And you know, simple things like you know, attending the briefing session, seeking clarification throughout the process, they're all points of contact of engagement with the partners to so just make sure that the success is there in the end. And as a result of that one, they were successful in, in, in being awarded the, the project. And as a result, from, a, from my understanding, the initial concepts of the uh, delivery is of a very high level and very high quality. Thanks so much, Scott. Some really great examples there that's taking us into, into thinking around stakeholders and who it is that we actually want to work with. So for the panel, you'll notice that I'm going a little bit off script and just changing the order around slightly. I hope that doesn't panic you too much. But I think that's really interesting in thinking around who the, the we is. Who is it that we actually want to work with? And Catherine, I think your previous example that you shared with us, you know, you'd worked with a team, it was really positive. So you moved into that, that co-construction of the next grant application to, to extend those relationships. I wonder if, Catherine, you might give us some advice from an industry perspective about how it is that you determine who it is that you want to work with. What sort of stakeholder mapping do you go into? Okay. Well, you know, to be perfectly honest, I don't think you know, looking for which partners or stakeholders we like to work with or we need to work with is any different than, you know, looking for and building relationships in life. I mean, basically, we need to look for like-minded people who we have something in common with and then spend time building the connection. So I guess for me, trying to work out who are the right partners that we we need to be or want to be working with is about you know looking for partners whose values and work aligns with our priorities but that takes time and I think that people need to really do their homework I think something that Scott said around you know the fact that the organization that was pulling the application together for your tender had worked really hard to build up a whole network of relationships because I guess from you know a, a, a partner's point of view we don't want to be tapped on the shoulder at the last minute we want to have already had these conversations to understand how we work in similar ways or there's crossover between on issues that we we are our priorities or that we're interested in pursuing and developing and uh, or addressing so I think, again, that takes time, knowing how to connect in. Often, like it's as basic as, you know, a government 
department is a, is a big bureaucracy. So even trying to find a doorway in, you know, we've all sent emails off to the generic inbox and haven't heard, haven't had anyone to follow up. So if you if you can find even one person in that organisation that you can have a, a chat to and seek their advice to help direct you to, the, to another person who might be able to then also give you advice. And it, that's the way it goes. Word of mouth and referrals are absolutely invaluable to connecting, finding and connecting with the right people. I think when mapping potential partners, as I said, you need to look for commonalities between the issues and priorities and then leverage those when you're approaching potential partners and show the ways that, look, we have this history or concern with this particular issue. We, we have this opportunity that's come along. We're aware that that crosses over with, with your priorities. And there is a dearth of information publicly available where government departments and services have publicly available strategic documents, councils, they have their community wellbeing plans and their 10-year community strategic plans. ISLED has a 10-year healthcare services plan and a whole range of documents that feed into that. Our service, the Health Promotion Service, has a strategic framework. All of it's publicly available. So you can look around and see where the overlaps are and the potential to start conversations with these organisations actually are. But I do think it comes down to finding one person who can help direct you on your way into a, an organisation or government department. I, I would really like to give a plug, given my background, to the community sector. Uh, we work with quite closely. They have incredibly strong existing networks and relationships amongst themselves. We need to respect that community-facing organisations have an incredible uh, amount of knowledge and understanding of the needs of their community. And at the end of the day, we are all trying to serve the community in what we do. So if we're developing a new initiative or intervention or project, do we, and that relates to translation as well, do we really understand the need because at the end of the day, it's the consumers in the community that are going to be impacted potentially by this new project or partnership. So I guess I do want to give a plug to tapping into the advice and the networks of the community sector, that they're community-facing, not-for-profit organisations. They are so connected to their communities and they understand those cohorts and their aspirations and their needs and I think that, you know, community sector should be an integral part of your network of relationships. We need to listen to the voice when it, of the community when it comes to not making decisions about what their needs are and how best they can be met. And it's also, you know, you may miss out on an on a opportunity to tap into a very rich source of information which helps you to co-design programs and, and interventions. So, yeah, I, I guess that's a little bit all over the place, but that's pretty much what we do when we are looking for partners to join us on any initiative or project. Thanks. Thanks for being so honest with us, Catherine, and I really appreciate that, that piece of advice to find a person. Kylie, I'm really interested to hear your perspective around stakeholders too when, you know, one of those finding that a person is in another university and another team. How do you negotiate the complexities with industry and another university? Thanks, Lisa. And I'm going to be very brutally honest too and answer this a little bit differently, if you don't mind, with actually sharing two um, failures <laughs> and what I've learned from that, I guess, and then not, not from the middle leadership tender that I just shared. One of the first tenders that I, well, the first tender that I was actually part of, I was quite inexperienced, well, very inexperienced. It was my first tender. And I'd probably say at the time there wasn't a good strategy behind tendering at UOW. So we were quite isolated with our approach to pull it together. In that space, I panicked, I think, 
and identified someone that I'd worked with prior many, many years ago as an external partner to work with. And I did that, I think, probably because of a lack of confidence and a lack of resources that I felt that I had internally at the time. Now, that was a, a, a bit of a disaster in many ways in terms of we went to the briefing, we did all the application together and we actually went to tender and we got through the first two stages. And then one of the pieces of feedback we received is that we would be successful at the next stage if that particular person um, wouldn't continue to be part of the team. So that was a very, very difficult and complex situation to be part of. Um, it required a lot of very deep soul um, digging, a lot of strategic thinking, and a lot of really difficult conversations. Um, the second one, I was in a, a different tender again, where we knew we had to partner with another university to be able to be successful with the tender. So we started to think about who that other university could be. And we were pretty sure that the particular university that we favoured at the time would be a good fit for us based on their reputation alone. We hadn't worked with them before. And thankfully, we spent a lot of time working with them and talking with them prior to actually committing to go to the tender. And through that conversation, we both actually worked out that it wasn't a good fit we didn't have the same intentions around why we wanted to be successful with the tender. As a team, we weren't very cohesive. We had different beliefs and assumptions around best practice for the tender. And I guess as a whole, you know, diversity is really important, but so is unity. So we couldn't actually, you know, whilst we had diverse skills that, you know, could work well, we actually couldn't find a, a commonality and a common purpose to work together. So those two experiences were quite uh, sobering in many ways, um, but really taught me the importance of uh, um, spending time really thinking about why you need a partner to begin with. Um, we ended up winning uh, that particular tender without a partner in the end, um, and we've been very successful with it. And also, I guess, what the intention then is of, of partnering. And I know that's a different way of partnering, Lisa. It's not you know, particularly the client as the partner, it's actually a third party. But, uh, it, you know, they were really incredible experiences for me. I guess the things I've learned from that space, as I said, diversity is important, but so is unity. Spend time having some really rich discussions before you actually commit to any partnership to understand people's intentions, their worth it, work ethic, their goals, their purpose. And their, and their ideas and do that in a very open and genuine and authentic way uh, before moving forward. Thanks so much, Kylie. Some really tricky situations that you very generously shared with us all. <laughs> so we started with the best case to enable us to, to sort of show a little bit of warts and all as well as we're really having, having the, this sort of conversation so that we can make sure that we're supporting each other as colleagues um, moving forward. Now, Kylie, you um, identified in your scenario just then that you didn't feel particularly aware or, or supported by systems and processes at UOW. Now we're very fortunate to have the amazing Scott on, um, on our panel who has done some really impressive work in terms of making sure that UOW researchers are supported in that space. Scott, I wonder if you wanted to share some of your um, expertise around stakeholders and finding the right partners. Perfect, look, thanks Lisa. Yeah, look, in my couple of years here, look, I've been fortunate to work with a lot of great, great people with sort of great vision on what they want to achieve. But to your point, maybe not necessarily supported by, you know, systems and, and process and, and resource. So a lot, of the, a lot of the time people come to me and, you know, they say they want to engage with stakeholders. And the first thing, you know, they say, is, well, how do I do it? And there's, there's a range of different ways. But a lot of the time I, I sort of summarize it under a couple of key themes some of which have already been touched on. You know, Catherine, you touched on alignment to strategy and, and vision. Look, that's absolutely key. I think you both mentioned around you know, identifying commonalities. You know, if it's funding entities, you know, it is aligning to that vision and that strategy of, you know, a view of how can we help them, not what we can do. So it's very much around identifying those, those commonalities. But the key one I, I ask people is, you know, how many relationships do you have? Who do you know? 
And they always know a couple of people. And I say, look, leverage those existing networks. It's you know, seeking referrals from the people you know, uh, but also referring people as well. Look at it as a sort of reciprocal kind of process. You know, good people refer good people. And if you're referred to someone else, there's obviously a trusted person. They're going to trust the person they've referred. So the likelihood of you building a strong engagement early on is a lot easier than if you've sort of just picked up the phone or reached out to someone uh, without that referral. Um, I do advise people to join associations and industry bodies and engage in their activities, you know, getting known. Uh, it'll help you build your credibility. Yeah, I'm not saying you need to go to everything and every every lunch and every every webinar, but just actually getting your name out there and your brand is really, really important. Social media is one that comes up a bit. I, I must admit, I get a little bit of resistance when I start to push LinkedIn, but you know, advising people, you know, social media presence is a good thing. But remembering to engage. A lot of people look, say, oh, I've got a profile, but I say, well, what do you do with it? And they say nothing. And the things that you can do with your social media platforms is you know, actually sharing content, sharing case studies, good news stories, commenting on other people's work. It's really about your brand. It's about getting out there. And, and also, you're yeah, building on those relationships comes down to a sort of frequency of engagement and alignment. So, you know, how often are you engaging with the key people in your networks to build your reputation, to make sure that, you know, you are known, that you get to you know, build that level of relationship where you can reach out to someone and have a conversation. And, you know, I often get asked about, you know, what are the tools and resources and frameworks that can be used to support this? And, you know, there's some, there's some easy, some stuff you can get off online. But I've been able to build a couple of tools, particularly for, for anyone in UOW that can really help with your stakeholder uh, mapping exercises. And I break that down into four very simple categories. One, you know, first being brainstorming, which is effectively just documenting down all the key people you know uh, in your networks that you know, are aligned to this, this vision and, and have the commonalities, uh, but also identifying those that you don't yet know, but you want to know. So yeah, it could be you know, relevant government departments, sub-departments, it could be other partner, um, you know, other universities, other associations, list all that down. And then the next phase of that is around categorizing. How do we categorize those groups? You know, it could be you know, state government departments, funding entities, could be other universities, it could be you know, associations within industry. You know, it could be student groups, as well, community groups, I think Catherine mentioned as well, that you know, have a lot of influence and, and support in the, in the sector. And then after you categorize, it's around prioritizing. So where do I need to focus my energies most? You know, we don't have an unlimited amount of time. We're mostly time poor. But by categorizing, we can then put our energies towards where do we need to focus our, our time to build that, 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 those relationships. And then the final part of that is around engagement. So that's your engagement strategy. You know, yeah, it's it's around you know, your touch points. It's how often I need to engage with these people. How do I engage with these people? What information can I share? How do I get these people to be strong advocates of what I do, but also have a level of influence that can support me uh, or support them as well in achieving their goals, but also supporting you on that that common vision. But I think another one, you know, Kylie, you mentioned, you know, the, it's really important about your internal networks. Uh, a lot of people talk about the partners being the funding entity or whether it's your, your other institutions or industry associations. But, you know, you have your partners in delivery as well, which is your internal partners. And that can be, you know, finance, that can be legal, that can be contracts, that can be your research services office. It's important to make sure you focus some of your energies in building relationships internally as well, uh, because sometimes they can also be the difference between a really good application uh, or a smooth application process and delivery, you know, to, to a difficult one. Uh, and I've seen it go both ways where, you know, a, a contract has been won, but because of a poor level of engagement internally, there's been some challenges and we've put some systems and processes in place to help rectify that. And we're seeing improvements, but I think it's important to balance some time with your internal um, stakeholder engagement as well. Thanks so much, Scott. I'm reminded of a previous panel where one of our panelists said, you don't ask for money on the first date. So I think it's a, a really nice reminder around having those really strong relationships and, and building on those. Given the conversation that we've had so far, I just wanted to check in with each of the, the panellists just for some insights around best practices. So we, we've had conversations, you're also experienced in the area, things that early start researchers need to be so mindful of when engaging in best practice with partnerships. Kylie, we might start with you this time. Sure. A couple I, off the top of my head. One would be no 
the long-term intentions, I think, of, of the partnership and the program that you're working in. For me, that's been critical in right from the start in terms of knowing is this a short-term relationship, a long-term relationship? Is the work that we're partnering in going to end up, you know, completely in the, the hands of, of the client or the funding organisation? And what does that then mean for your own IP and background and, and all of those type of things? So I think knowing the long-term intentions are really important. One of the things we got tripped up in once was uh, scaling up. So we entered into a program thinking it was quite small scale because we weren't aware that the intention was to scale up the program, which required a lot more resources and thinking. So all of those things, I think, are really incredibly important in best practice. The only other thing, which is probably sounds quite simplistic, but again, it's something we've been tripped up in, is underestimating <laughs> the time, money, personnel required in the administration and project management side of, of tenders and partnership work. Uh, it's incredibly important to have money, people, people you trust who know processes to work alongside you around all of the administration, all of the program management. And, and the processes to help you negotiate that. So I think it's, a, it's an incredibly important part to consider right from the start. Get right and build those processes well in partnership with your partners and then carry that through. Thanks, Kylie. Catherine, some best practices from your perspective. I guess from, again, being in the local health district, one thing I think that is really important is to make sure that it may be at the start of the approach to, to a partner like ISLED, or it could be in the initial stages, it's very important to try to secure buy-in for to support the project from key decision makers. And that needs to be there from the very start, particularly sort of at a more senior management level, because you might connect with the most enthusiastic project officer or staff member in, in an organisation and there's an assumption that their involvement or signing up their organisation is a done deal, but there are limitations and, on things that we are allowed to approve and be part of and those often those approvals need to be signed off before the project can sort of proceed. So I think no manager wants to hear about a project when it's sort of already in train or well on the way and or even when something's gone wrong and they maybe weren't aware of what the organisation had actually committed to. I think, again, the basics of having clearly defined goals and objectives with clear timelines is really important. You know, and those can be adapted through discussion, but at the end of or the point at which yes we're doing this we we have um, a commitment to progress there is at least a, a clear idea of the what and the why <clears throat> and I think the outcomes as highly mentioned because that is so important for the translatability of whatever you're doing and again I reiterate that for health that is super important and also the sustainability and Kylie you mentioned you know how is this project going to be handed on if your idea is that we're there for the pilot phase but then you guys are going to pick it up afterwards that has to be clearly on the table from the start um, and vice versa like you know in terms of sustainability we, we don't just want to do stuff for the sake of it it's great while you've got the project funds but once the those are spent what happens next who who is going to keep the the activity or intervention happening What's the cost to that? I love a good MOU, a memorandum of understanding, because it absolutely clearly defines each partner's contributions and deliverables. And again, it's really vital for when things go off track or things go wrong, or one of your partners is perhaps not stepping up in the way that you expected. It's really good to, to revisit the, that commitment that's 
dictated there in the memorandum of understanding and a, and a point of negotiation and discussion on how you can move forward. Again, simple but very basic and important is to have strong governance, reporting on you know, how the funds are being managed through to all the details, I guess. And to, along with that, you know, to have regular scheduled minuted working group meetings so that everyone's there. We're all aware of where the project's at. There's a record of how things are progressing. And it, it basically keeps all partners accountable for the deliverables that they've signed up for. I think, you know, in terms of best practice when you're pulling an idea together, again, the agenda that you come in with, you have to be really careful how you present that because partners can, you know, potential partners can often sit there and think, oh, well, you've packaged that up. You know, we didn't really get a have get a say. It's it's like you know, ready to go. We you just want us to sign up for it. So I think that you know that consultation, co-design, that is so critical to to keeping people on board right from the planning stage. And I think be prepared to be flexible and compromise if you need to on the model or plan you have for a project or, or, or partnership because, you know, through that consultation, you need to get a good understanding of what the other partners' priorities are, what their needs are, and also what their limitations are. So, yeah, that was it really. There's a lot more. I think the last one I did write down was constant, enthusiastic communication. We don't want the, our partners to disappear. We want to be kept in the loop. And often the initiator of the project or program can be seen to be looking after everything. So, you know, if you don't want to end up as the lead agency or service, uh, if you don't want to end up shouldering all the responsibility and everyone just turns up for a ticker box meeting, you need to keep communicating and, and speaking up when you need other people to, to do things by a certain time or, you know, because something's arisen. Yeah. Thanks, Catherine. Some, again, really great advice there for us all. Scott, you've seen a lot of tenders, successful and unsuccessful. I wonder if you wanted to share any more best practices or perhaps take us into some worst practice scenarios. Thanks, Lisa. Well, think, yeah, Catherine and Kylie have sort of captured a lot of the key things there that, that does work. So I've definitely experienced some some really good and some some not so good. So I could sort of flip them, flip it on its head, really. But where I've seen probably failures in in tender applications or pre-tender work is around probably the lack of networks and lack of relationships that exist. Yeah, there's all sorts of statistics out there, but you know, some statistically they would say that if you if the first time you hear of a tender or first time you see a tender is the day it's released and it's with an entity you've never engaged with, you could already wipe off 50% chance of being successful. Um, I don't know the science behind that, but realistically it comes down to the strength of your relationships and the networks you've had. Um, and I've seen times where people have seen a tender, they've just seen dollar signs and they've gone, we'll give it a go. And yet yeah, majority of the time they haven't necessarily been successful. I think reputation and branding is key. Yeah, having a strong repu reputation and branding in the case of you know, early start, there is strong reputation and branding that can be leveraged. Use that where you can. You know, leverage the institution, leverage your own brand and your team's brand to actually increase your success. By not doing that, you become unknown. And if you're not known, then you sort of struggle to get that through your response application process around why you're the credible resource, why you're the credible people person that needs to, to deliver the project where i've seen it go really bad is where people don't set expectations of um, the project team members early so a tender response could be as little as a week to, to three to four five weeks where there aren't assigned responsibilities and keeping people accountable and accountable to a time frame it becomes an 11th hour dash and i've seen you know instances where we're you know nowhere near completion having to ask for extensions that's never a good look from a partner perspective or funder perspective when you're asking for um, extensions but also doesn't come across in the in the in the in the proposal around you know, what you're going to do for a benefit and outcome it becomes very transactional and the questions are somewhat just answered at a q a forum not necessarily actually explaining what's going to be done and delivered 
and it lacks that sort of engagement partnership approach to what a project should be. To, to Catherine's point, it's around having flexibility. If you come out with a rigid proposal and saying, this is what we will do, because you haven't had a level of engagement, you're not familiar with the strategic vision of what the funding entity is, then that's not going to come across in your response. Another one, and I, this is almost a mandatory must have that some people don't do, and I see it fail, is not attending the briefing sessions and asking questions. Specification documents are vague. There's not a lot on a few pages of text. Yeah, not going to, to the briefing session, you're missing a great opportunity to really understand what it is that the partner of a funding entity actually want. But there's actually sort of a hidden uh, approach to that as well is by attending those, the evaluation panel are, are attending them as well. They get to see you, they get to meet you, they see that you're interested, they see that you want to be part of this project and you want to be the successful respondent. But also, it gives you the opportunity to really build credibility as well. If you haven't got that strong credibility, you being there asking questions is something that they will remember when they're actually evaluating your response. By not going to that and just answering without going to any briefing session or asking any questions through the forum, you're sort of going in blind. You know, the first time they hear or see of you is when they're going through your actual application response. That's not what you want to do. And again, I've seen more successful tenders where there's been strong engagement through the application process than I have people who haven't actually engaged. And I think, you know, we've, Catherine absolutely touched on it, saying yourself, Kylie, you know, frequency and clear communication. You know, through, a, through an application, a tender application project, it's so like a mini project plan, keeping everyone updated internally and externally. You know, internally, there's, you know, there's approvals processes, there's other support functions like finance that can maybe help with the, you know, if it's around costing of, you know, project management support, having another set of eyes or having trusted internal partners to question what you've actually developed and say, well, is that right? Have you got enough, you know, have you budgeted enough for this milestone? Have you budgeted enough for project management support? So just making sure you've got multiple people involved, um, even reviewing your applications before they go in subject to time um, can sometimes be the difference between a successful um, application and not. Thanks so much, Scott. And I liked how you um, managed to weave some of the, the worst practices in there as well in such a positive way. I think that's really useful because, you know, I think hindsight's a great thing and we can all reflect on experiences of that we've had positive and negative, but um, taking the opportunity to learn from those is, is so important. So learning from each other is important there too. One of the things that's coming across all of our panelists today is the importance of relationships and how important it is to have them, to be able to understand the relationships that you have and what the expectations are within there and to, to leverage them for opportunities. I'm wondering if each of our panelists can now share an example of a relationship that has existed in a partnership that has been really positive and unpacked for us um, why that was so. Scott, we'll start with you. No, thanks. Thanks, Lisa. Um, look, a really good example I, I can actually think of was when I was actually in the health space. There was one person particularly had just, they'd ingrained themselves within this health service. It wasn't, wasn't local, this was actually interstate. They'd ingrained themselves through previous engagement, through a specific project. I think it may have been a commercial research project that they'd done. And they'd really just built their level of credibility to a point that they would just become a trusted advisor. And, you know, though they were you know, interested in doing multiple projects, they actually became someone that they could constantly reach out to for support and advice around projects, around certain, uh, certain initiatives that they were driving, updates to sites of strategic plans. They became that trusted advisor. And over the course of a period of time, they got to a point where they were actually became the advocate for this organization. They actually became the advocate for this department to actually commission projects aligned with the expertise that they were able to deliver, but also to actually appoint and recommend certain service providers to them. So they became somewhat of an almost an intermediary between this health service and also so the academic institution and associations and had that level of credibility was at such a high level that every time there was a need, they were actually referred work. And they got to a point where they actually referred quite, quite a number of different projects that they actually had to then draw upon their own networks as well to actually support and partner in delivery. So I think that's an example of me that someone that started at a baseline who didn't have a relationship that through constant engagement, through regular regular 
influence and obviously delivering great work as well, was able to get it to a point where they actually be, did it remove that actual sort of client, customer client, kind of supplier relationship to actually be a true partner. And I think that's really key is you don't want to be seen as you know an entity that's funding someone for a project and seen in a supplier light. You want to be seen as on equal level, as a partner. You can work together. To, to Catherine's point, you want to be in a position where you can sit in a room and agree a change of scope. You know, and be happy to do that and trust each other equally that we get to a point where it's like, well, this is the best outcome that we can deliver. And, you know, you mentioned before, I think, you know, Kylie, around like IP and, you know, who owns a program moving forward. Where you have such a tight level relationship and partnership approach, you're in that position where you can have those conversations. I've seen it where you can have a supplier, you know, real supplier customer type relationship where, you know, that's difficult to have. It's really difficult. And I think, you know, this example I, I can, I'm thinking of, it, it dates back a few years now, but they just absolutely owned the relationship. They had such good partnership and they were such a credible expert. And I think that was a real model for me to go, well, that's the sort of goal that you want to achieve. Thanks, Scott. Um, Catherine, you talked before about, you know, the ongoing partnership that you've had with Tony and his team. I wonder if you might be able to comment for us on relationships when new people come in and projects expand, um, whether you've got some insights there. Um, uh, I think possibly, you know, just relating it to what Scott's saying, we had such a positive experience, you know, going through that first round of, of funding that that trust is there and that understanding that this organisation gets us and we feel like we get them, they're going to take this with us on a track that is going to work. You just have that positive mindset as you're going into negotiating another phase or stage. I guess the new partners that have come on board, they are LHDs like we were initially. So it's been really good. As I mentioned, we've been able to sort of strengthen our sort of networking and connection with those LHDs th through being a part of this similar program. Yeah, so I feel like we're able to help onboard them really and, and support them as the project unfolds for them. Yeah, it's only been positive and I guess the new partners, I wasn't involved in that second, negotiating the second funding applications. So I'm not quite sure how those new partners were identified, but that is actually how LHDs are, or health promotion services across LHDs are used to operating. We are involved in a number of other, I guess, pilot or, or the upscaling, you know, phase of other projects. So, you know, there's almost an acceptance that we're happy where something's been piloted, it's been looked at closely to then when there's a call for who wants to join us, who wants to get on board, that's actually really attractive to a lot of LHDs because we know what we're signing up for or what we're joining with because another LHD who, you know, we identify with, we know they're in, they are more or less in the same boat as us, has already been down that road with that partner like a university it has that academic rig rigor it's a no-brainer actually to if you get the opportunity to join in because you know in our in these days of financial realities any you know if there's funding available as well it's a win-win absolutely and that win-win is really important Scott, you've talked a little bit about us having to have a brand and our brand being known and everything that, that comes with that. For us here in Early Start, we are a research entity. We are part of our faculty, the ASH faculty. We are part of UOW. So that comes with a certain degree of branding. Kylie, I'm wondering if you could talk about what industry expects from a UOW researcher. Well, I think from my experience, the reason we have been successful with um, of tenders in particular probably with the New South Wales Department of Education but a couple of other ones as well I think does come down to reputation um, and not necessarily even the people in the team but actually UOW and I, I certainly know the first tender that we were part of we were known 
as an institute that were committed um, to working with the community and in partnership with the community. And I know a couple of the other organisations that went up that were shortlisted. Actually, their reputation was is solely around, you know, possibly high levels of research and high levels of, of theoretical knowledge, but not necessarily application and practice. And I, I do think probably a couple, at least, of the tenders that we've been successful with, the feedback we've received is because we have a long-standing um, and known and transparent history for wanting to work with the community, a genuine a genuine, I guess, purpose for for wanting to make sure that what we do, what we know, what we research actually translates into practice and application and being able to bridge the two. So I think, you know, that was one thing that certainly got us over the line, but as, as also sort of flipping back to your original question around relationships too, has allowed us to have longstanding relationships with our partners. You know, that's what they expect from us. They expect well, certainly from the teams that I've been part of, is to know our research, to know our theory, but know what that looks like in practice and application, to be a critical friend, a mentor, a coach along the way, you know, for them to be able to bounce ideas, give advice, not come in too heavy though, you know, to, to have that sort of that, that ability to be able to not, not partner from above the expert, you know, the fountains of all knowledge, but actually work alongside shoulder to shoulder and, you know, bounce around ideas, bring our different perspectives and be able to have uh, strong working relationships that, you know, create that equal that Scott was talking about, Lisa. And I think, you know, for me, that's certainly probably been the basis, as I said, of establishing and, and continuing our, our relationships with our partners. Thanks, Kylie. Catherine, how does that fit with what you expect of an early start researcher? Um, yes, definitely. And I think that sort of reiterates things that I talked about earlier in terms of looking for the right partners as well, but what your expectations are as you go into negotiating some sort of joint partnership or project. So I guess that leads me into a piece of advice around, you know, basically just understanding that partnerships need to be a two-way street and that's as basic as it is, you know, especially with respect to the benefits of getting involved and the relevance of, of being involved as well. It has to be, it has to work for all the bodies involved, all the partners. You know, I can't sort of speak for the whole of, the local health district but for my service I would always be wanting to consider how the project is going to value add to our core deliverables you know and what we are tasked to deliver in to to the community I guess it's always that's going to be our reference point and as well just wanting to know that the expectations on our service are reasonable and achievable and that's in the light of, of our, our limited time and resources. Both We definitely are open to partnerships and we love to hear of new ideas and open to conversations. Thank you, Catherine. And Scott, does that fit with what you understand industry expects of UOW researchers? Yeah, absolutely. But you, 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 Catherine, what you said there sort of resonates with me. I think from a, from an early start researcher perspective, I think you know, if I could give you some advice, is to start early, but be committed and be persistent. It takes time. Yeah, you know, I've talked of you know the example just before of of an academic that has such a strong relationship with with a health department that they become a trusted advisor. That didn't happen overnight. There was lots of probably failed attempts to to engage. You know, there may have been some small projects that led into bigger projects. There was no doubt challenges along the way, and it no doubt took a long time to get there. So the advice is, is you know, back yourself, be committed, you know, follow a process, keep the frequency up with, with your stakeholders. Don't let relationships lapse. It's if you've got a relationship with someone, don't not talk to them for the next two years because you've sort of got to rebuild it from scratch then. But also, you know, back yourself as a, as a credible expert. Yeah, you know, that'll help you build your reputation as well. You know, a lot of 
all the tendering that comes out is because a, you know, a department or funding entity actually has a need and you are the expert and you have the expertise. So you know, go into it with a mindset of you are the person that can give them what they need, but also you use that to help leverage and build your relationships as well, because it may seem like a bit of a grind at the start where people are not returning your calls and your emails, but you'll get to a point where they will start ringing you. And yeah, that's where you want to be. But it just, it takes time and persistence. And yeah, if you stick to it, you'll, you'll absolutely get there. And there's plenty of examples and case studies of, of where it's actually worked. Catherine, Scott and Kylie, thank you so much for all of your insights and being so generous with your expertise. I know that this is going to be a really taken up seminar and I know that your your advice and your, your insights into the whole process of partnerships is going to be well received by many of us here in Early Start. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.